Today is Wednesday, March 29th, 2023, and we're here to study the book of Genesis at the Four Lakes Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin. We're very glad to have you with us, but uh, we hope you can be with us in person this coming Lord's Day morning at 9.30. We're getting back to our study of the book of Isaiah, and then join us at 10.30 for the worship assembly. We're continuing on in our series, Preaching Through the Book of Hebrews. So hope to see you in person this coming uh, Sunday morning. If you have any comments or questions, any concerns about class tonight, I would invite you to give a call or send a text to the church number, which is 608-224-0274, or send an email to fourlakeschurch at gmail.com. We really want to hear from you. And if you've not yet subscribed to our YouTube channel, we want to invite you to do that as well. But tonight we're back to the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings written by Moses, and we're now looking at the life of Joseph. He's been uh, sold by his brothers into slavery in Egypt, and through an extended series of seemingly unfortunate events, Joseph has now ended up in charge of the land of Egypt. Uh, as a result of interpreting Pharaoh's dreams, Joseph is now responsible for getting the nation through seven years of famine. And under his leadership, the nation has saved up huge stockpiles of grain at this point, and they are now selling grain back not only to their own people, but to the surrounding nations coming to them for grain as well. And that puts them in a, just a terrific position in terms of their economy and in terms of the power of that nation going forward. So Joseph is uh, pretty much second in command only to Pharaoh, which means that Joseph is basically king of the world at this point. He has uh, virtually unlimited power. Well, this brings us up to Genesis chapter 42, verses 1 through 5. So we'll start tonight with the first paragraph, Genesis chapter 42, verses 1 through 5. Now Jacob saw that there was grain in Egypt, and Jacob said to his sons, Why are you staring at one another? He said, Behold, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us from that place, so that we may live and not die. Then ten brothers of Joseph went down to buy grain from Egypt, but Jacob did not send Joseph's brother Benjamin with his brothers, for he said, I am afraid that harm may befall him. So the sons of Israel came to buy grain among those who were coming, for the famine was in the land of Canaan also. And to me, verse 1 is almost a typical old man dad. These people are about to starve to death. Everybody knows there's grain in Egypt. And old guy Jacob basically says, why are you sitting around looking at each other? Why are you staring at one another? In other words, you people need to go take care of this. Uh, he's an old man at this time, uh, elderly, and his children are grown, and they need to go get food. This is, uh, this is up to you guys. You need to go and uh, get this over with. And this is life or death, isn't it? If we skip down, look according to the end of verse 2, so that we may live and not die. So this is incredibly serious. And so the ten older brothers travel down to Egypt to buy grain. But we learn from this passage that Jacob does not send Benjamin the youngest because Benjamin is now the favorite. And this will be more clear over the next couple chapters, but it's uh, pretty clear here, isn't it? I mean, um, I've got 11 kids. This one can't go to Egypt because he might die, but I'm going to send the ten. And uh, what does that tell us about Jacob's attitude toward the ten? Well, they are at least somewhat expendable, aren't they? So if I'm going to lose my kids... I'm kind of okay with the uh, first 10, but uh, this last one here, really, I need to keep him at home so he's safe. And in verse 5, it seems that the others from the area are traveling down to Egypt as well. So this famine is widespread. It seems to be growing. And uh, things are severe enough at this point where they need to actually go down and get grain from somewhere else. So they're heading down to Egypt. So let's continue on then with Genesis 42, verses 6 and 7. The next paragraph, just a couple verses here. Genesis 42, verses 6 and 7. Now Joseph was the ruler over the land. He was the one who sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. When Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them. But he disguised himself to them and spoke to them harshly. And he said to them, Where have you come from? And they said, From the land of Canaan to buy food. In verse 6, we have Joseph's dreams fulfilled, don't we? Uh, this is exactly what he dreamed about. Years earlier, Joseph had dreamed that his brothers would bow down before him. And obviously now it is finally happening. That vision or that dream has been fulfilled. However, his brothers don't realize it yet, do they? They don't, they don't see it. Uh, Joseph sees them coming, and so he disguises himself. A number of years have passed. Joseph was a teenager the last time they saw each other. 
And we understand today people change over time, don't they? Especially as they transition from teens into adulthood. So we have that going on here, but also Joseph has completely transitioned into a completely different culture, hasn't he? Uh, we know from last week's study that he is now wearing Pharaoh's clothing. We also know that he is wearing Pharaoh's jewelry. He's also transitioned into the Egyptian culture in other ways as well, including perhaps shaving his head and uh, who knows what else. Uh, who knows what has happened to him over the past 20 years. There's a good chance that uh, Joseph looks nothing like he did uh, back when he was a teenager. And we'll get to this in a little bit, but Joseph is also not speaking their language anymore. And I think that is a huge part of this as well. Um, they are communicating through an interpreter. So Joseph can understand them. Uh, but they cannot understand Joseph. And the other part of this is that Joseph speaks to them harshly. So he already knows, but he demands to know where they've come from. So he's playing dumb here. And they explain that they are from the land of Canaan, that they've come down here to Egypt to buy food. Uh, as to the timing of this, I think we noted a few weeks ago that Joseph was uh, 17 years old, wasn't he, when he was sold into slavery in Egypt. And then a week or two ago, I think we noted that Joseph was 30 years old when he interprets Pharaoh's dream and is put in charge of preparing for this famine. So they've then also had seven good years on top of that. And so we are now at least one year into the famine. So if I've calculated this correctly, Joseph's brothers last saw him at the age of 17. And he is now at least 37 years old, if not a little bit older. So if I understand all that correctly, at least 20 years have passed between the first time or the last time they saw their brother and when they first see him down in Egypt. So I would kind of ask, uh, do people change at all over a 20-year period? Well, as I was preparing for tonight's lesson, I went back and found a picture of me right around the time we moved to Madison. This was back in the year 2000, so maybe uh, April 2000. That's uh, when we moved up here. So this was uh, 23 years ago, roughly the same length of time that Joseph's brothers had gone without seeing their brother. Um, I had a face back then, back in the olden days. I wore a coat and a tie back then. And uh, I think I've changed just a little bit over the past 20 years. I mean, look at what you people have done to me. <laughs> uh, but I'm just saying that it is uh, very reasonable to believe that Joseph was unrecognizable by his brothers. It is certainly uh, well within the realm of believing this. This is something that we can understand. He was 20 years older. He was wearing different clothing. He was in a position of power. He was hundreds of miles away from the place where they had last seen him, and he was speaking a different language. Um, I think of seeing my grandmother, my uh, dad's mom, in a nursing home for the very first time uh, many years back. And uh, growing up, we only got to see her once or twice a year, but after she suffered a stroke, we went down to see her. And when I came into the room at that nursing home for the first time, I wasn't exactly sure who she was. And I was a little bit embarrassed of that. Um, but looking back on it, I, I understand that. I, I think mainly because her hair was different. Her hair was normally, she had some, some good big hair going on. And I went into the nursing home there and her hair was in a ponytail. She never wore a ponytail. And uh, not only that, she was in a different place. This is a, a place I'd never seen her before. And so all of these things kind of added together. And, and I didn't really recognize my own grandmother for the first couple moments. And uh, I'm just saying that Joseph looks very different than he did 20 years earlier. And uh, he certainly uses this to his advantage. And we'll see that going forward over the next few chapters. So let's continue with Genesis 42, verses 8 through 17. Genesis 42, 8 through 17. But Joseph had recognized his brothers, although they did not recognize him. Joseph remembered the dreams which he had about them and said to them, You are spies. You have come to look at the undefended parts of our land. Then they said to him, No, my lord, but your servants have come to buy food. We are all sons of one man. We are honest men. Your servants are not spies. Yet he said to them, No, but you have come to look at the undefended parts of our land. But they said, your servants are twelve brothers in all, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And behold, the youngest is with our father today, and one is no longer alive. Joseph said to them, It is as I said to you, you are spies. By this you will be tested. By the life of Pharaoh, you shall not go from this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of you that he may get your brother while you remain confined, that your words may be tested whether there is truth in you. 
But if not, by the life of Pharaoh, surely you are spies. So he put them all together in prison for three days. Well, here in a classic brother move, <laughs> Joseph accuses his older brothers of being spies, doesn't he? And Joseph is pretty much the king of the world at this point, as we've noted this evening as well as last, uh, last Wednesday in our study. And so he completely takes advantage of that powerful position uh, to harass his own brothers. And uh, what a position to be in. But these were the brothers who had uh, beaten him up and sold him into slavery uh, many years earlier. And we should also note that Joseph, in verse 9, remembers the dreams that he had about his brothers. And so Joseph realizes that this is not random. Uh, this did not just happen, but rather God is in the process of fulfilling those dreams. So God is behind this. And so for this reason, Joseph, he really plays into it, doesn't he? Well, they deny being spies. They explain that they have merely come to buy food. Uh, they are all sons of one man. They claim to be honest men. Are these honest men here? Well, not exactly. Joseph knows that, uh, that they have a reputation for not being honest at all. Remember, they completely deceived Jacob into thinking that Joseph had been attacked and eaten by a wild animal. If you remember that from a few chapters back, they uh, didn't outright lie to him. Uh, but they presented him with uh, the coat of many colors that had been ripped into pieces and dipped in blood, and they kind of allowed Jacob to make his own assumptions there, and then he, they kind of guided him uh, down that path. And so they claim to be honest at this occasion, and when they make this claim, Joseph presses them on being spies. A number of times he repeats this. He accuses them of scoping out the undefended parts of the land of Egypt, and at this point they they spill a bit more information in an attempt to defend themselves. They explain that they are 12 brothers in all. Uh, this will come back to bite them. Um, the sons of one man back in Canaan, the youngest is back home, and the other brother is no longer alive. I absolutely love the book of Genesis. Of course, they are speaking to the brother who is no longer alive, aren't they? They're, they're talking to him face to face. And let's note here that it can be rather difficult to keep up with a lie, isn't it? I mean, it's easy to remember the truth. It's easier to remember the truth than to remember the details of a lie. And I think a lot of us know this uh, from experience in trying to keep up with things on our own, or at least seeing this in other people. Uh, Joseph is not dead, but they say that he is dead, and yet that's not the truth. Really, they don't know the truth about Joseph. They don't know where he is. They just know what they did to him. Well, at this point, Joseph presses it even further. He proposes this test. Um, I'll know you aren't spies when you bring your young, younger brother here. And until that happens, um, you're going to be hostages here and uh, as, a, as a guarantee. But only when the youngest shows up will I know that you're telling the truth about not being spies. And for good measure, uh, he puts them all in prison for three days, kind of, I don't know, maybe to soften them up a little bit. Uh, and as one of our members pointed out a few weeks ago, we have yet another reference to three days in this book. Uh, so thank you, Abe, uh, for pointing that out. That was, uh, Abe pointed that out a couple weeks ago. But uh, another reference to three days here in this chapter tonight. So uh, kind of interesting. Uh, three days is a period of time repeated several times in Scripture for some reason. We have Jesus in the tomb for three days, of course. We have... Uh, Jonah in the belly of the big fish, and so on. I think a number of other references to three days. Uh, certainly the uh, the cupbearer and the baker, there were three days involved in those visions. That's when it first came up in, uh, in this class. But let's continue tonight with Genesis 42, verses 18 through 25. Genesis 42, 18 through 25. Now Joseph said to them on the third day, Do this and live, for I fear God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers be confined in your prison. But as for the rest of you, go, carry grain for the famine of your households, and bring your youngest brother to me, so your words may be verified, and you will not die. And they did so. Then they said to one another, Truly we are guilty concerning our brother, because we saw the distress of his soul when he pleaded with us, yet we would not listen. Therefore this distress has come upon us. Reuben answered them, saying, Did I not tell you? Do not sin against the boy, and you would not listen. Now comes the reckoning for his blood. They did not know, however, that Joseph understood, for there was an interpreter between them. He turned away from them and wept. But when he returned to them and spoke to them, he took Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes. Then Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain and to restore every man's money in his sack." 
and to give them provisions for the journey, and thus it was done for them. Well, Joseph then gives his older brothers three days to uh, marinate a little bit and uh, gives them some time to think about this situation, let this sink in. And then he comes to them on the third day and he repeats this demand. And really, he seems to kind of have a, uh, has a, a change in his method here. If I remember that last paragraph correctly, he was going to keep all of them and send one brother back. Uh, but now he seems to soften that up a little bit by demanding that only one stay behind and the rest go back. Maybe he realized that it would take a number of men uh, to get the food back home. I'm not sure, but uh, for some reason he softens on this. Uh, if you are honest men, and to prove that you're honest men, uh, leave one of your brothers here. Uh, go get your youngest brother. Take the grain back home. And if you do this, you will not die. And so they descend uh, they decide to uh, to head back home. Uh, before they leave, though, they talk amongst themselves, don't they? And that's kind of uh, been a really weird trip down to Egypt. In fact, they see this as some kind of justice for what they did to Joseph. Uh, this is God's way of punishing us for what we did to our brother many years earlier. He was begging for his life. We didn't listen. And here we are. And now one of our brothers is going to be held hostage by the king of Egypt until we bring the youngest, and it's going to kill dad. And it's just a horrible situation. And in verse 22, Reuben chimes in, doesn't he, with an I told you so. Uh, typical brother uh, statement here. Did I not tell you? Uh, do not sin against the boy, and you would not listen. And uh, kind of a little detour here. Hope this is okay. But uh, sometimes we point out bad sermon outlines in this class, don't we, where somebody will... Uh, take a phrase out of context to teach something that may be accurate, but it isn't the point. It's not even remotely connected to the text itself. And I just want to say I've seen that here. Uh, I've seen sermons titled, Do Not Sin Against the Boy, or Do Not Sin Against the Child. And they take that little phrase that Reuben speaks here, but then the outline of the sermon suggests that we uh, can sin against the child by, you know, number one, not bringing the child to Bible class, and number two, by you know, not warning the child against the dangers of dancing or drugs or alcohol and, and just on and on. But uh, that's not really the point of this passage, is it? I don't think we get that out of this passage. So I'm just saying, again, we need to be very careful, not only that we teach the truth, uh, but really more than anything, that we that we are honest with the text, that, that uh, we are mindful of what the Holy Spirit intended by putting these words in the Bible and uh, certainly going off on those tangents based on this phrase is uh, not what God had in mind uh, when Moses put these words to paper. So uh, let's just be careful uh, as we teach and as we preach. But uh, So I guess I'm preaching to myself here primarily. But Reuben is making the point that the situation is a reckoning for what they did to their brother Joseph. And we should also note here that the uh, just the mental anguish that we suffer after sinning is a lot of times worse than what we feel at the time we first commit the sin. I hope we understand that. When these brothers were deciding to get rid of Joseph, remember how mad they were at him. You know, he's arrogant. He tells us these dreams that we're going to bow down to him someday. And so they beat him up, throw him in a pit, sell him to the Ishmaelites. They end up making their way down to Egypt. And I'm just saying at the moment they did that, it had to feel good or else they wouldn't have done it. It had to seem to them like the right thing to do. Um, you know, their conscience was obviously not uh, correctly trained. They were not moral people as they were making that decision. Either that or they violated their conscience by doing, uh, by doing wrong anyway. Uh, but I'm just saying when we decide to sin, a lot of times it feels good or else we would never have decided to do it. And certainly that had to be the case then. They were delighted to finally get Joseph out of their hair. We got rid of this dreamer. We're no longer going to have dad's favorite around here and so on. And uh, after even 20 plus years, though, they finally get back to it. And this is still nagging them, isn't it? This is still on their minds. They are tormented by what they did to their brother. So 20 years later, they're still thinking about what they did and still, at this point, at least feeling some sense of guilt for what they have done. In verse 23, we find that they have this discussion right there in Joseph's presence. And uh, I don't want us to miss that. Joseph is apparently over here, maybe to the side, maybe on a throne, and they're kind of over here talking amongst themselves, assuming that Joseph can't understand. Um, but remember, first of all, they don't know it's Joseph. But secondly, they don't know that Joseph or this Pharaoh-looking figure can understand what they're saying. 
They don't get that he can speak Hebrew. They don't know who this is. So they've been communicating through an interpreter. Well, when Joseph sees their mental anguish over what they did to him many years earlier, notice he breaks down, doesn't he? He can't handle it. And so he kind of turns aside. He goes over somewhere and he just weeps. He's overwhelmed at this. And he finally, he gets it together. He comes back. He takes Simeon, has him bound before their eyes. So very visual. I mean, don't forget this. Don't forget your brother here. Don't leave your brother in Egypt. That's never a good move. Kind of like what you did to me. Um, uh, but then he does something uh, both brilliant and devious. Notice he gives orders, not in Hebrew, but in the Egyptian language, to his servants to fill their bags with grain, to give them provisions for the journey. That right there is above and beyond. They weren't asking for that. But then on top of all of this, he also has his servants put their money that they brought to pay for the grain back in their own sacks. And so this money that they brought here to purchase the grain, he has it put back in their luggage. In other words, he gives them the grain, uh, but they don't even know this yet. So let's continue on then with Genesis 42 verses 26 through 28. Genesis 42, 26 through 28. So they loaded their donkeys with their grain and departed from there. As one of them opened his sack to give his donkey fodder at the lodging place, he saw his money. And behold, it was in the mouth of his sack. Then he said to his brothers, My money has been returned. And behold, it is even in my sack. And their hearts sank. And they turned trembling to one another, saying, What is this that God has done to us? So somewhere along the way, as they stop to feed one of the donkeys, maybe as they stop there for the night, one of the brothers opens his sack and he finds his money, the money that they brought to buy the food. And they immediately think they understand what has happened here. God is clearly punishing them for what they've done. And they understand they can now very easily be accused of stealing food from the king of Egypt. Uh, this guy is in charge of the world. He's got soldiers. There's a good chance they'll be chased down and killed. And they know that if Pharaoh wants to do it, he can very easily accuse them of stealing. And the evidence is against them. So they have both the food and the money they were supposed to use to pay for that food. Uh, but they clearly see this as God doing this to them. And they're right, aren't they? You know, they know more than they know, really. They, they understand God is arranging this. And of course, God is. Uh, not just for the purpose of punishing them in this circumstance, but that God will ultimately bring them through this alive. They just don't know it yet. So let's continue on with Genesis 42, verses 29 through 34. Genesis 42, 29 through 34. When they came to their father Jacob in the land of Canaan, they told him all that had happened to them, saying, The man, the Lord of the land, spoke harshly with us and took us for spies of the country. But we said to him, We are honest men. We are not spies. We are twelve brothers, sons of our father. One is no longer alive, and the youngest is with our father today in the land of Canaan. The man, the Lord of the land, said to us, By this I will know that you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers with me and take grain for the famine of your households and go. But bring your youngest brother to me, that I may know that you are not spies but honest men. I will give your brother to you, and you may trade in the land." In verse 29, then, they get home. They explain this all to their dad. There's nothing really new in this passage, but they explain to their dad that they now need to bring their youngest son, or his youngest son, back to Egypt to prove that they're not spies, and so that they can trade in the land. And their lives depend on it at this point. So this is what the king is demanding. All right, let's continue, and let's close tonight, really, with Genesis 42, verses 35 through 38. Genesis 42, 35 through 38. Now it came about as they were emptying their sacks that, behold, every man's bundle of money was in his sack. And when they and their father saw their bundles of money, they were dismayed. Their father Jacob said to them, You have bereaved me of one of my children. Joseph is no more, and Simeon is no more, and you would take Benjamin. All these things are against me. Then Reuben spoke to his father, saying, You may put my two sons to death if I do not bring him back to you. Put him in my care, and I will return him to you. But Jacob said, My son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead, and he alone is left. If harm should befall him on the journey you are taking, then you will bring my gray hair down to Sheol in sorrow. 
After giving that initial explanation, notice they start unloading their sacks. And now they discover that everybody has the money they were sent with. So it isn't just in one of the sacks. This is everybody's. And they're terrified, aren't they? They are dismayed. Jacob, their father, sees this. He is torn up. Joseph is gone. Simeon's gone. Now you people want to take Benjamin as well. This is absolutely terrible. And notice Reuben then speaks up with an offer. We'll take Benjamin back to Egypt. And if he doesn't return, I'll let you kill my two children. That's messed up, isn't it? That's messed up even for the book of Genesis. And this is one messed up book. And I mean, to me, there's no way this could be a legitimate offer. What, uh, what man would really consider killing two of his own grandchildren if one of his children doesn't come back? Again, that's awful. And what father would offer this? I mean, to me, Reuben is just making a rash oath. In my opinion, it's not a, a serious thing. I mean, I guess I couldn't put it past him. Um, but I would take this as uh, cross my heart, hope to die, stick a needle in my eye. I swear on my mother's grave, that kind of thing. Um, and so notice, uh, for now, we leave it with Jacob saying, no, this is not going to happen. You can't do this. Under no circumstances am I going to let Benjamin go down to Egypt. If anything would happen to him, uh, I, would, I would die. And that's basically uh, Jacob's message here, and that's the way we leave this chapter. So this is where we leave it tonight. Tonight we've seen God continue to take care of this family. They're still getting fed, aren't they? Worldwide famine. A grain shortage, and yet they're still eating. So if we kind of back away, look at the bigger picture, it's been a kind of a rough chapter for the brothers and for the father and the demands that have been made. They haven't dealt with that yet. We'll get to that next week. Uh, but I'm just saying that God continues to take care of this family, not in a way that any of them could have ever planned themselves. Uh, but God is working providentially behind the scenes to save his people through the famine so that ultimately the Messiah could be born to this family. So next week, we hope to continue with Genesis 43. And uh, thank you for joining us tonight. I hope to see you, most of you, in person this coming Lord's Day at 930, back to Isaiah. And then after class, come together at 1030 as we uh, get back to our study of the book of Hebrews. So let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we come to you tonight through your Son, who serves as our great high priest. We're thankful for prayer, for this opportunity, this amazing opportunity, to come to you for help whenever we need it. And tonight, we're especially thankful for your servant Joseph and for his wisdom and his courage in staying pure and focused on you, even in a foreign land, many miles away from his family. Tonight we pray the same for us, that we would put you first in everything that we say and do, even though we also are living in a foreign land, a land that is not ours. Tonight we also pray for those families who have suffered terrible losses over the past several days, from the storms in Mississippi and Alabama to the violence in Nashville. And we pray for those who are suffering in other ways as well. Sometimes this world can be a very dark place, and we pray that you would be with us, that we would shine your light around us. We pray that we as your people would open our eyes to the suffering that we see around us, and that you would give us, as your people, the wisdom to help as we should, just as Joseph used the wisdom you gave him to alleviate the suffering during his time on this earth. Thank you, Father, for Jesus. We come to you in his name. Amen.